Well, it's seven o'clock and <clears throat> good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Uh, we're gonna be talking, the main subject matter tonight, we'll be talking about the Haney soils test, but <clears throat> um, prior to doing that, you know, I think we need to acknowledge, uh, you know, how do we get to where we wanna be? Um, the first thing is I'd like to thank Kathy Richberg, our Director of Operations for helping get this set up. Michael, Ray and Blaine um, for all their behind the scenes activities and Gabe also. So I'm Shane New. I'm one of the partners in Understanding Ag and I'm a producer down here in Northeast Kansas. <clears throat> and, you know, I've kind of went the direction of starting to understand the soil microbiology as best as we can and, you know, really we need to start asking ourselves questions. You know, when we talk about these principles, we've got to start understanding our context. You know, and this was added a few years ago to the soil health principles. And when I think about context, I think about direction. You know, what's guiding me, what's pushing me, you know, wanting to build, you know, resiliences back into my farming situation, you know, or whatever it may be. And, you know, your context, text, you know, it can be spiritual, it can be your family, it can be financially driven, or it can be community driven. And oftentimes, you know, it's driven by all four, if not even more factors. So <clears throat> we've got to focus, you know, and we've got to acknowledge context, and we've got to find our direction or where we want to be. And I think most of us on this call tonight are trying to figure out how do we get our soils back to functioning, you know, the way they once did or sure making them more productive within our systems. So I know many of you have heard Gabe speak or probably many others, you know, talking about the principles. And, you know, we always talk about minimal to no soil disturbance. You know, a lot of times we're talking about no-till practices, but you know, we also have to understand, you know, we gotta be cautious with our, with our animal impact. You know, we can do a lot of disruption with livestock too. But the reason as, or minimal to no soil disturbance, when you start looking at things in a microbiological aspect is, we've got to start understanding what's going on below, below the surface. And right here is just a good illustration. This is a fungal strand and it's what we call sporulating. So it's starting to germinate. And you can see this fungal strand. Now this is at 400 magnification. <clears throat> so, it takes a microscope in order to see these, but think about these thread-like materials that are in our soils. You know, we talk a lot about mycorrhizal fungi and the association it has with plants, but you know, there's thousands and thousands of species of fungal component in our soils. And if there's one thing we're missing in most agricultural soils, it's the fungal component. And it's a very critical part of the soil function. But I just wanna see people, when we go out here and we do a lot of tillage, I'm not saying discouraging tillage to a degree. I think we need to minimize our disruptions in a field. But when we use tillage, we destroy these fungal hyphas. And, you know, and we don't have these fungal hyphas, we're gonna have a difficult time getting our soils to function the way we want to. <clears throat> if I get my turner right. But here's just another slide of showing some of this microbiology. But you know, what I really wanna show here is, look at this fungal strand. Now this right here, you know, we could call this, you know, aggregate formation, or it could be a humic compound or fulvic compound. But what I found ironic as I, you know, work with the microscope, is when I start seeing these fungal strands, how this organic matter or whatever it may be attracts to it. And you'll start building these these shapes and these forms. And I often think of this, you know, this is starting how I build my soil aggregation, but what I'm trying to refer to is these fungal strands are wrapped all over this particle. And it's what's building. And these little dots here, those are bacteria. Now this again is at 400 magnification, but these little bacteria are one to two microns in size. So <clears throat> the bacteria build the microaggregate, but it takes these fungal strands in order to build the macroaggregate. 
And that's what we see sometimes, you know, in our soils, we see these aggregate structures. Now this is a particular field I have, and this was a couple of years ago. And, you know, I kind of went down and checked the soil surface. I couldn't believe the aggregate structure starting at the top of the soil. And it went down about six inches where I could physically take my hand and, and push it down through the soil with very, very little resistance. Now think about how much water infiltration is now being created. Think how much more oxygen I'm diffusing in my soils. <clears throat> Think how much more nutrient cycling is occurring. So it takes the microbiology in order to get this accomplished. So that's one of the reasons why we really wanna be cautious, you know, and we say minimal to no soil disturbances, we, we don't wanna disrupt that microbiology. You know, the next principle we'd like to talk about is cover on the soil surface. You know, build that armor. Well, these are just a couple examples of some of our fields. And why do we want that armor? Well, one reason is we've got to remember, you know, at least in my part of the world here in Kansas, we get a lot of thunderstorms, you know, and a raindrop is coming down between, you know, 18 to 21 miles per hour. I've heard as much as 25 miles per hour. Well, I want to dissipate that energy when it hits that cover. That's one reason why I want to do it. Another reason why I want to do it is because I want to hold that moisture as long as I can within my soil. Because all this microbiology we're talking about work in what's called a water film environment. You know, this is just an, another um, photo I took. These little pineapple looking structures, these are testate amoebas. They got a little flagella out here on the front. And when they're active, they'll take that flagella and they'll suck that bacteria inside of them. And that's what they eat. And right here, this little round thing, that's a fungal spore. And there's a couple more in this same slide. But, you know, they talk about, you know, in healthy soil, there are as many organisms as there are humans on the planet. So this, this sample right here, this is one mill of soil with 10 mils of water with one eyedropper full put on a slide underneath the microscope. Now look at the abundance of life. So this is just trying to reinforce when we talk about the principles, there's a reason why we need to make sure we have these principles in place because this microbiology is extremely critical to accomplish what we want. Another reason why I wanna keep the soil surface discovered, you know, that moisture as I talked about, but also keeping our soil temperatures, you know, where we can optimize plant growth. I hope I did this right. I converted Fahrenheit to Celsius, but at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but 21 degrees Celsius, 100% of our moisture is used for plant growth. At 38 degrees Celsius, 15% of the moisture is used for growth and 85% is lost through evaporation and transpiration. At 54 degrees Celsius, 100% of our moisture is lost through evaporation and transpiration. And when we get to 60 degrees Celsius, you know, we're killing our microbiology. And these microbiology, like I said, that's what's building our soil structure. That's what building our micro and macro aggregates. So it's critical. And I know many of you farm in what we call brittle environments where you had, you know, you're limited on your rainfall or your rain season. So we, it's, it's critical we understand we gonna keep that moisture as long as possible not only for our plant growth, but keep that microbiology functioning for us. Another reason we want that cover on the soil surface is to start decomposition. You know, I know a lot of people like to do compost. They'd like to talk about compost and taking compost inoculants and treating their seed. And I'm not opposed to that, but mother nature built in a composting mechanism. You know, we've got to get this litter down on the soil surface. And if we have moisture, it's gonna decompose and it's gonna cycle those nutrients with the microbiology in our soils. Now remember all these leaves and stems on the outsides of them have a lot of the same microbiology that's in the soil all over them. So if we get this residues down on our soils and we go through our seasonal, trans seasonal changes, those biotic glues that hold that microbiology all over these leaves and stems will fall apart, fall off of there. Now they can enter back into our soil <clears throat> and help us with nutrient cycling. 
and decomposition. So minimal disturbance, cover on the soil. You know, now we start cycling nutrients. We go from immobilization of nutrients back through mineralization of nutrients. You know, living roots in the soil at all times. You know, this is just a great example. You know, this picture on the top right here where my cursor's at, I went out to a field today. We were 54 degrees Fahrenheit today here in Northeast Kansas. This is annual ryegrass I planted <clears throat> right after Thanksgiving. I mean, we're capturing sunlight, solar energy. And, you know, we're now feeding, which is this slide here illustrates, we are now feeding soil microbiology. You know, we're taking liquid sun and producing root exudates carbon and feeding our soil microbiology. Not only are we doing that, we're also producing organic acids by the plant that's dissolving a lot of minerals from our silt sands and clays in our soils. So it's just interesting you know, most people in my part of the world, and I'm sure same in yours, you know, we plant one crop a season. And, you know, that crop is really only vegetatively growing maybe 75 to 105, 110 days. Well, we're missing capturing a lot of photosynthesis, a lot of liquid sun <clears throat> and feeding soil microbiology. So what happens when we are monoculture and we stop growing and we don't have something living in that soil, you know, feeding us microbiology. Well, it's gonna spore up and it's gonna stop working. So it's critical we understand, we wanna keep a living root. And I understand a lot of this in context. You know, a lot of you guys up in, in Canada where you're located, you know, you don't have this opportunity sometimes, but I always look at, you know, you never pass up the opportunity if it's presented to you to get a root in the soil. <clears throat> So diversity of plants. So why is diversity so critical? Well, that picture I showed you of those root exudates being excreted by that root, you know, each plant sends out its own chemical signals. It produces its own type of, you know, sugars, carbon to feed different soil microbiology. So it attracts different microbiology. So that's the reason why we always want to try to, if at all possible, to add diversity to any of our cover crop mixes or our cropping schemes, or our pastures, our perennial systems. You know, that diversity of different root exudates being produced, feeding different soil microbiology, that just adds diversity into our system. It helps us build more resilience into our systems. <clears throat> this is a great photo that I found, but it shows the architecture of these roots how that diversity, each plant has different root rooting architecture. You know, some of these plants, you know, what we call forbs, look at the tap root on them. Look at a lot of our grasses, look at the hair root structures on them. Now think about that's always pumping carbon, you know, solar energy back in the soil feeding microbiology. And this photo shows a pretty good example. If you look at it well enough, you can kind of see the carbon layer in the soil, the depth of carbon that's existing. <clears throat> Animal impact, you know, this is the last principle. And, you know, I always think of it as the, one of the most important principles, you know, along with everything else, not excluding anything, but this is where on an operation like mine, this is where we take our economic gain. You know, we either graze these forages for maintenance diets, for yearlings, but gain on animals, and even our pasture pork operation. It's amazing to me how much our hogs will forage if we give them the ability to. You know, the animal impact allows, you know, like I said, an economic gain. And that's what we're trying to do is trying to generate income. But what I'm also wanting to try to get achieved is I want to move microbiology. Every time those animals move throughout that landscape, they're shedding hair, they're shedding microbes that's being distributed throughout my soils. You know, and we're also doing the conversion of immobilization to mineralization of nutrients. So one way we do economic gain is we'll graze yearlings on a lot of these cover crops. You know, we're trying to keep all the principles in place. 
We're trying to do minimal disturbance. We're trying to build cover on our soils. We're keeping a living root. We're adding diversity and the animal impact. But like I said is, as these animals travel through, and as you can tell, we paddock our animals up. We do move them daily. You know, we don't want to do overgrazing. You know, we're just trying to utilize 50% of this forage at the time being. But we also want some of that cover down on the soil to help see, feed the soil microbi microbiology. And we're also going to go to immobilization and mineralization of nutrients. So as those livestock forage, as we all well know, you know, they're going to move manure and urine. And, you know, that's moving microbiology for me. Now, if I'm paddocking these animals up, you know, we're helping get that manure distribution a lot more uniform, a lot tighter within our landscapes. So those are things to consider when our management, you know, but just like underneath that particular cow pat, when I kicked it over, you know, you see all these soil microbiology or soil microorganisms or organisms functioning for me. I mean, there's some scorpions here. You know, they're burrowing into the soil. They're moving that mineralized material back into my soil. So now it's being recaptured again, back by this vegetation. Cycling nutrients, the decomposition. Like I said, this is just basically terrestrial composting. So, you know, we need to make sure we understand a few things when we start talking about soils and understanding I know a lot of times we talk about things like carbon to nitrogen ratios and you know a lot of times guys get confused how we make this work for us definitely on our operations so <clears throat> i thought it might be a great opportunity to do at least a little brief discussion discussion about it so here on the left you know this is a carbon nitrogen ratio i would i call close to about a 40 to 1. so that means i got 40 parts carbon one part nitrogen so it's gonna decompose fairly rapidly if I would terminate it. So what I mean by that is if, let's say hypothetically that even though this is a warm season cover crop, maybe I'm wanting to plant corn in here. Well, corn needs its most amount of nutrients, you know, at the time of ear fill. So at a 40 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, if I planted corn into this, you know, in about 65, 70 days, I'd be cycling a lot of this nutrients and this biomass through the microbiology back into my corn production when my corn really needed it. You know, I'd ear fill. Now we go over here where there's some same sorghum sedan, but it's been allowed to get to a greater maturity. Look at the carbon to nitrogen ratio of an 80 to one. Now the decomposition of this is gonna be much, much longer. You know, I couldn't find a good photo, but I was wanting to show, illustrate, you know, we plant a lot of soybeans in the cereal rye. You know, the cereal rye at Antesis is close to 70 to 80 to one. You know, so in comparison, it's about the same carbon to nitrogen ratio as a sorghum sedan. <clears throat> so it's going to take it a lot longer to decompose, to go from immobilization of nutrients into mineralization than a 40 to one. So, but what does we work, make this work to our advantage is, is we can lay this tremendous amount of biomass down as either in cereal rye or something like the sorghum sedan, produce a tremendous amount of cover on top of our soils. And then when we really need that additional nutrient for soybeans is usually in late July, early August in our part of the world. And that's about 120, days, not quite that much, probably closer to 95 to 110 days. But now we're cycling those nutrients back into that soybean plant. And it's the same with this sorghum sedan. You know, this sorghum sedan, <clears throat> you know, this is first of November in my part of the world. You know, we'll utilize animals coming here and graze. We'll knock a lot of this down, build a lot of armor on our soils, a lot of cover. But this is a great opportunity if we wanted to no-till corn into this to come the next spring because my carbon to nitrogen ratio with the fall and the winter, not much decomposition is gonna occur. But when spring comes around and when my corn starts ear fill, you know, the third week or fourth week of June, 
that's when these nutrients are really going to be cycling. So now I'm going to capture a lot of these nutrients from this vegetation, cycle it back through the microbiology back into my next production crop. Brianna, do we have any questions or, and if I hadn't mentioned it earlier, if there's any questions, feel free to type them in at any time and then we'll stop and acknowledge them and answer them. Not so far. Okay, thank you. So like I said, it all starts back with the microbiology. Now what I wanna show here, illustrate here, here's a, a bacterial feeding nematode. Mr. The, Shane, I just okay. got a question for you. Yes. <laughs> just in time. Yes. Uh, Mr. David Edegar asks, if you have a cover crop at 40 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio and it freezes, do you still assume 40 to one or does the CN ratio go up? Well, your CN ratio, whatever time of termination will be pretty much at carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's not gonna fluctuate much. Now, it's not gonna decompose if you get into cold because the microbiology is gonna slow down. It's also gonna be dependent upon how much moisture you have. You know, so if you're in a brittle environment with not, not much moisture, you know, it's gonna take much longer to decompose versus a more arid environment. And I usually call it, air, you know, a humid environment. I mean, I hear people refer to that as about 28 inches of rainfall. Now, I'm not sure how many millimeters or centimeters of rainfall that is, but that kind of distinguishes whether you're in a brittle, if you're less than 28 inches, or a more humid if you're above 28 inches. So, but no, at a, at a freeze, if you're at a 41 to carbon to nitrogen ratio, that's what's gonna hold that at that freeze. Mr. Uh, Paul Overby says that um, NDSU research is not showing that uh, the cycling of nitrogen happens as quickly in our cooler climates so that it's being tied up longer, but eventually uh, eventually available over time. And that's probably correct. I mean, it goes back to context. <clears throat> so if you're more of a colder environment, you know, the cycling, the, you know, the activity is gonna be much more reduced, but the benefit of that is you guys aren't gonna burn organic matter near as rapidly as what I do down here. So you don't have the growing days, the heat as we do down here. So as you guys build resiliencies, cover on your soils and you get that nutrient cycling working, you're not gonna burn up that near as rapidly as what I'll do down here. So that's one of your advantages. Does that make sense? because your microbiology is not gonna be near as active. So as your soils cool down and get colder, your microbiology is still gonna be functioning, but they're not gonna be functioning near as rapidly as it would be at warmer soil temps. So yeah, it's gonna take probably longer to cycle, but you're also gonna build more of it. Shane, if yes. I may. This is Gabe. I just wanted to answer Paul's question, um, shed a little more light on it. It's important to remember, though, that the NDSU studies were done in a conventional field. They were not done in biologically active regenerated fields that have uh, had multi-species covers and been in this system, a system, a regenerative system, long enough to establish a high biological component. Once you get uh, more biologically active soils, then you will be able to cycle those nutrients much faster, even in our colder climates. Now it's true, obviously, during winter months, they will, you know, the, that biology will sporulate and will not be active. So you're right in what you say that we will not burn through carbon as fast. As fast, however, it is not correct to assume that 
we will not be able to cycle a significant amount of nitrogen and other nutrients via biology in a northern environment. And great points, and thank you for bringing that up, Gabe. I mean, that's the reason why, if, yeah, if you don't have the diversity, <clears throat> he's absolutely right. And that's the reason why it's critical to, you know, make sure we follow these principles, you know, in order to get to where we want to go with our soils functioning. So anyhow, you know, we're still talking about, you know, carbon to nitrogen ratios. But, you know, we talked a little bit about the above ground, you know, carbon to nitrogen. But we're going to kind of focus a little bit here on our below ground carbon to nitrogens. So this is a bacterial feeding nematode. And all these black things inside this nematode's gut are bacteria. And the bacteria, these little dots out here in the solution, you know, and what's kind of amazing is one of these bacterial feeding nematodes will eat about 10,000 bacteria a day. So, you know, think of what's occurring nutrient cycling wise when we have these predators within our, within our systems. But just to kind of give you a little bit of illustration here, you know, nematodes carbon to nitrogen ratio <clears throat> is a 30 to one. So he needs 30 parts carbon for every part, one part nitrogen. And a bacteria's carbon to nitrogen ratio is a five to one. So bacteria is made up of five parts carbon to one part nitrogen. You know, so how many of these bacteria does this nematode need to eat to meet his carbon to nitrogen ratio? Well, he's gonna have to eat six, but the big thing of it is we gotta think about these, this biology, especially the bacteria and fungi. I mean, they're bags of nutrients the way I like to look at them. And, you know, and the only way we get that nutrient that's with inside that biology, especially the bacteria, is it takes something eating them. I mean, because now when a bacteria consumes a nutrient, let's say like nitrogen, it's bound up in its metabolism or its body structure. So it takes something else to come along to consume it to go from immobilization of nutrients, that's what the bacteria are, the nutrients are immobilized with inside their bodies in order to mineralize those nutrients. So the nematode eats all six bacteria to meet its carbon to nitrogen ratio. But what's he doing with the excess nitrogen? What's well, coming out the back end? I mean, this is how mother nature's nutrient cycling works. It's not only just nitrogen, guys. <clears throat> it's phosphorus, it's sulfur. It's all of these minerals and nutrients that's tied up in the metabolism of the microbiology, but we need the predators to come along to utilize them, to cycle those nutrients, making them plant available. So this is the portion of a plant available nutrients the Haney Soils Test measures. And what we're talking a lot about is amino acid structures. I mean, this is a form of nitrogen that our standard soils test never picked up. But Dr. Rick Haney's soils test, we utilize this. This is plant available nitrogen that a plant can use to help assimilate proteins within its structure. <clears throat> now, one thing about Dr. Haney's test is, you know, a, a, a standard soils test, you know, we use a lot of caustic acids. Nature doesn't use those same caustic acids to measure nutrients. Can we extract them? Can we get them off the surfaces and, and show they're there? Yeah. But mother nature works with acids that are produced by the biology, by the plants, and it uses water. I mean, that's, you know, mother nature's solvent is water itself. So, and that's what Rick's, Dr. Rick Haney's test uses. It's a water measurement. So, I know most of you, Michael, acknowledged to me, a lot of your guys' a soil test were done at Ward Laboratory. Lance Gunderson, who used to work at Ward Laboratory, now started his own lab called Regen Ag Labs. So the same person did your test verification, but it's gonna look just a little bit different than maybe your Ward soils test, but the same things are on your test. So you're gonna, you should see a column 
and I'm trying to recall in my mind here as I'm talking, and maybe Gabe can help me, but on the, the old ward test, I think it was on the left-hand side, up towards the top, you should see a sole organic matter. But you know, and I've got it highlighted here in red, in this particular soil sample, it was 2.2% organic matter. You know, what I want you guys to really start understanding is, you know, what's that organic matter telling me? You know, the organic matter is telling me what size a home do I have so for my soil microbiology. And, you know, I kind of look at things, I try to keep things simplistic so I can remember them. So when I'm looking at a soils test that we receive and I see uh, soils, organic matter of 2% or less, you know, that's a pretty small home. And, you know, there's not a whole lot going on, but we got to keep things in context too. So now let's say if I get a soils test that comes out of the Chihuahuan desert in Mexico, and I see a 2% organic matter, you know, I got to put it in context. That's probably not too bad for that part of the world. But if I get a soils test from let's say, you know, Northeastern Iowa, and I see a 2% organic matter, you know, I got to put that in context because historically that's probably close to 12% organic matter and 2% is pretty poor for that region. So just, just keep bear that in mind, but these are just, you know, visuals to let you think about. When I think about more organic matter, think about how big is my home. And we want to see these numbers kind of increase you know, as we start implementing, you know, regenerative agricultural practices, start applying the principles, you know, and being intentional about doing them too. So when we have an organic matter from about two to 5%, you know, you know, our home starts to get a little bit bigger. You know, we go from a kind of a trailer house, you know, kind of a small, a small home, kind of a starter th home. But as we start increasing our organic matter, you know, our house gets bigger and we want it to get bigger. So, you know, when we start getting up around 5% organic matter, you know, we're starting to build a pretty good size home. And that's good because we're going to need it. And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So just think about when you, when you look at your Haney soils test and organic matter is the same, no matter what kind of soils test you look at, it's all done the same. So it just tells you how big a house do I have within my soil. So the next thing I like to look at when I look at Haney soils test, I like to look at soil respiration. So my CO2 respiration, what's going on? This is kind of telling me what's my microbiology, how much microbiology do I have in my soil sample? You know, and this one here is about 46.4 is a reading on it. So, you know, we talked about the organic matter at 2.2, the size of home. Well, the respiration is telling me you know, how many people are living inside that house? You know, and if I have a 46 respiration, you know, remember we're talking about microbiology, you know, that's telling me how many people are living inside my house. You know, so if I see a CO2 respiration, and this is the way I like to look at it, it's less than 50, you know, it's a good thing, you know, I don't have a very big home, if my organic matter is at 2.2, like this particular sample is because I don't have very many people living in it. But as, as I start building organic matter, you know, I'm gonna start building the amount of people that can live with inside my house. You know, the microbiology, you know, so I like, you know, when we start seeing our ranges start increasing, you know, from like 50 to 150, you know, there's gonna be a lot more people living there. And if we start getting our CO2 respirations greater than 150, you know, we've got a lot of people kind of living in that house. So we need a bigger house because we got a lot more people and we got a lot more diversity of people. So these are snip, simple analogies just to kind of think about stuff. So remember organic matter is the size of our house, the CO2 respirations, how many people are living with inside the house and our soils. You know, the next thing I like to look at is organic carbon so organic carbon, that's basically the food for my soil microbiology. So basically, organic matter is a house, respiration is a people. Now this is how big is my refrigerator inside my house. 
So 123, that's not bad. You know, so I, I like to keep things in simple terms and analogies. So, you know, with the water extractable organic carbon of, of 120 something, I, I'm going to have a decent sized little fridge. You know, I'm going to have a freezer compartment, a couple doors. You know, I can stock quite a bit of food in there. But, you know, it's like all of our rest of our measurements, we want to start seeing this increase. You know, we like to start seeing our, you know, our water extractable organic carbon, you know, get up in the two to three hundreds. You know, as we start increasing organic matter, you know, we start increasing the people that lives inside of our house, you know, we're going to have to increase the size of our refrigerator. So, like I said, remember, organic matter is the size of the house. Respirations, how many people live inside the house. Our organic carbon, water extractable organic carbon, is how much food is in the refrigerator. Now, it doesn't do us, and, you know, before I, hold on, let me get a little too ahead of myself, but the next thing we're going to look at is MAC, and that's microbial active carbon. So basically what Mac is telling me, if Mac is telling me, you know, I've got a little bit of food, I got a decent sized refrigerator inside my house, but how well does the people, the microbiology like to eat the food inside the refrigerator? You know, there may be some, you know, we may have some decent amount of food inside of a refrigerator, but we may not have a lot of diversity, you know, if all I had in my refrigerator was Brussels sprouts, well, myself, I'd probably starve to death because I really don't like Brussels sprouts. But we got to think of that in the same terms of our microbiology. So that's a great point Gabe made just a little bit earlier. That's the reason why we want diversity. We want different root exudates because that's what's producing different foods, you know, to feed different microbiology. So We've got to understand we, we need to have a little bit of diversity in our diet. We need to have something, you know, something, you know, even though I may not like everything in this, this salad photo here, you know, a large portion of this I'll eat. So think of percent MAC is how well is the biology utilizing the food, consuming the food that's in the refrigerator. And, you know, you know, here's a nice three course meal. You know, so most of the microbiology, including myself, you know, I pretty well starve all this down. So we got to think of things in simplistic so they're easy to remember and think about. So we'll just go back through this one more time real quick, and I'll stop here and see if there's any questions before I go any further. So organic matter is the size of our house. Respiration is how many people live in our house. Our water extractable organic carbon is how much food's in the refrigerator, but the percent MAC tells me how, what is that microbiology like the food that's in the refrigerator? And when I see a 37.6% MAC, that's telling me my microbiology, we got a lot of Brussels sprouts there and nobody wants to eat them. So, you know, we like to see this, this percent MAC at least get to a 75, if not even a little bit greater. So, Brianna, I'm going to stop there for a second if there's any questions or anybody has any questions. So the first question I got was, um, what's the fastest way to get the occupants up in the soil? What's the fastest way to build occupants in the soil? That's a great the, question. The respiration. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that here in just a couple minutes. So I will acknowledge that one here in just a, about three more slides. Okay, so we'll, we'll um, I'm that. just going to make sure here. Did everyone find the MAC? Yeah, if there's okay. somebody who um, didn't do their soils test and they want me to go back through that, I can real quick. But No, there was a question on where it is on the soil test, but I guess they found it. Um, goals for organic carbon and MAC. Goals, you know, I want to see more organic carbon continually rise. You know, I want to start building more and more food inside my refrigerator. So, you know, I like to see, you know, at least above a 150 to 175 minimum. And I want to see that number grow. And I want to see my percent MAC at least get above 75, if not closer to 100. Because that's telling me my microbiology is utilizing 
the food inside the refrigerator pretty well. Okay. Gabe, do you have any comments on that? No, Shane, you, you got it. Yep. Any other questions, Rayanne? Yes, just uh, the ward analysis reports, it looks different than the regen lab results, but it's uh, it gives you this similar results. It's just the format that's different. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you look, I mean, <clears throat> Lance kind of did his form different from Ward's way it was initially set up. So, but everything, all the same information's with, contained with inside here. It just takes maybe a minute or two. Mr. Shane, through, like, maybe you can just uh, give a few seconds once you mention what you're going to talk about for everyone just to find it on their test and then uh, talk about it, please. Okay. Well, let's talk about carbon and nitrogen. So I think the carbon and nitrogen on the old Ward Labs Haney Salts test is over on the right-hand side. Uh, if I remember right, it's the second. It's like the second box of information below aluminum and sulfur and magnesium, the next category down, you should see a carbon to nitrogen ratio. So I'll give everybody a minute. So basically what the carbon to nitrogen ratio is telling us is, it's telling us you know, exactly that. What's our carbon to nitrogen ratio within our soil? You know, mother nature kind of programmed these soils about a 10 to one to a 12 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. You know, we really don't get much concerned about carbon to nitrogen ratios, not unless we really start seeing them get out of kelter. You know, so this carbon to nitrogen ratio here really doesn't concern me a whole lot. But now let's, let's just hypothetically talk about this. Let's say if the carbon to nitrogen ratio was like a seven to one. So that means I don't have a lot of carbon in my soil. So now we've got to stop and think about this. So I don't have a lot of carbon in my soil. My C to N ratio is a seven to one. You know, how do I think I need to manage this? Well, we're probably going to need to grow, you know, some more lignified vegetation, a higher carbon component because we're cycling nutrients pretty rapidly, you know, at a seven to one. So think of it this way. Let me think of a simple analogy here. Think if you're around a campfire and you know, it's, and it's roaring pretty good, you know, but the only thing I have to feed the campfire is twigs or little small branches, you know, it's going to consume them really quick. So we're not going to keep that heat up if we don't find some bigger material. So think of it that way. You know, and, and the opposite's true. So let's, you know, we don't get too nervous about carbon and nitrogen. Now, if I start seeing something get above a, you know, 15 to 16 to one, you know, that's gonna throw up a few little red flags because now I've got a lot of carbon in my system and not much nitrogen. So how am I gonna manage that? Well, it's the same analogy. If we got a campfire, you know, and we just have a few embers burning in it, but all I have is big logs to throw on it. You know, those embers sooner or later will burn through those logs, but it's gonna take a long time. So I've gotta be, you know, I don't wanna keep dumping, if I have a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, I don't wanna keep dumping a lot of carbon, you know, cropping schemes, high carbon into that. You know, we're gonna to have to kind of look at, you know, mixing it up a little bit with a cover crop mix, a blend, our cropping rotations. So that's just kind of a way to look at that and think about it. So as long as you're, you're within the realm of, you know, like an eight to one to like a 15 to one, I wouldn't get too nervous about my carbon to nitrogen ratios, but I would pay attention to them. But we start getting, you know, below an eight to one or above a 15 to one, then we need to start focusing, you know, on, you know, the species we're using, the, the cropping rotation and our cover crop mixes. So, so that's one way to think about it and look at the carbon and nitrogen. 
Is there any questions on that, Brianna? Not so far. Okay. Well, good um, yes. The field I have is up is 15 to 19 on five tests. That's from Paul Overby. Okay. <clears throat> well, if, you know, like we've said, okay, if we're getting up around that 19, you know, I want to start, you know, kind of focusing. So we're probably going to have to look at if we're designing cover crop mixes or cropping rotations, we're probably going to have to use a little bit more of a legume component. And we'll talk about that on this particular soil test in a minute. So we're going to have to heat that, you know, get a little hotter fire. Definitely that 19 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio, you know, within our soils. So we start cycling our nutrients a little bit better. So those are some things to kind of be aware of and think about. <clears throat> you know, I'm not sure if this has been, you know, a grain crop, you know, uh, cereal crops on top of cereal crops or what your rotations have been. But yeah, if we start getting up close to that 19 to one, we probably need to start thinking about cropping schemes and, you know, looking at our cover crop design mixes and also livestock. Is there any others? No, not at the moment. Okay, we'll go to the next item here. <clears throat> so this one right here, if you look at the top, and I'm trying to recall an old ward test. I think it's over on the left-hand side. It should be inorganic nitrogen. No, excuse me, that's on the right-hand side. You should see inorganic nitrogen and organic nitrogen then you should see an organic nitrogen to inorganic nitrogen ratio. So I'll give everybody just a second here to try to find those under sheets. <clears throat> Michael, when was most of these tests, or Blaine, or Rihanna, when was most of your tests taken up there that they're looking at? They were done in, uh, it's Michael here, they were done, done in uh, uh, May, early June of uh, 2019. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the inorganic nitrogen, when you look at that, that's plant available nitrogen. When we look at the organic portion of nitrogen, I mean, that's bound to a carbon molecule. So it's not, it's, it's bound up. It's not available yet. So when we look at our organic nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen, like this particular sample, we see a 1.67. So what's that telling me? Well, <clears throat> if you look at this, this particular report we're looking at, this was taken in November. You know, their soils were getting cold and stuff. So when I start looking at these information, now this all goes back to context. I want to see my organic portion of my nitrogen being bound by carbon. So that's telling me if I've got any soluble nitrogen out there, I've got a carbon molecule that's capturing it, that's holding it, keeping it in place. So I want to see in the fall of the year, I want to see my organic portion of my nitrogen being bound to a carbon, being held up. But as I transition from fall, winter into spring, I want to see this organic number start to decrease and I want to see more inorganic number start to increase. Because now it's telling me I'm cycling nitrogen in my soils. So an inorganic nitrogen, organic to inorganic nitrogen of 1.67, you know, that number doesn't bother me a whole lot because I'm putting in context for the time of year. You know, a lot of times we'll see these numbers, you know, at 0.5. You know, so in the spring of the year, I want to see this number start coming down, become a lower number. But if I'm looking at the soils test in the fall of the year, I want to see that number start rising up. So remember, in the fall of the year, I want to see any soluble nitrogen I have in my soil, I want to see it being bound to carbon, so I'm holding it. But in the spring of the year, I want to see it being converted from organic to inorganic form of nitrogen, now I'm making it plant available. Now I'm capturing that nitrogen, cycling it back through 
the vegetative biomass of a plant for production. Are there any questions about that? Shane, this Gabe, I'll just add to that. That is exactly the reason to have something growing in the fall of the year. And I realize our Northern environment, there's often, you know, years where we're just not able to get a cover crop established, but we can certainly open up the sieves on the combine a little bit, pass a little over to uh, germinate just so we have a growing plant there to uh, convert that in organic and tie it to carbon molecule, put it in the organic end state to hold those nutrients on our farm for the next year. That's just critical to do that, to save you dollars, save you significant money in input costs. We need to be thinking of this all the time because we know that that the nutrients you apply in any given year, if you're applying synthetic nutrients, less than 50% will be used by the plant that year by your cash crop. So you better have something there to hold it. Otherwise you're gonna, you're gonna lose it. So you know, it's that's a good business. <clears throat> Thank you, Gabe, and that's a great point. Now, you know, Gabe brought up a couple of things that I probably didn't do a good enough job explaining. Yeah, when you go out here and you put synthetic nitrogen down, you know, think of this biology, think of it as kind of like the mafia. You know, they're gonna take their cut of that synthetic in, that nitrogen, those nutrients you're putting out there. They're gonna tie it up in their metabolism. And you're not gonna capture that for your plant vegetation. The other thing of it is, every time you go out here and you put synthetic nutrients out there, remember that's a salt. And as I talked about earlier, this microbiology works in a water film environment. Well, if I start putting salt out here, what do you think is gonna happen to my water? It's gonna get bound to that molecule of salt. It's gonna be pulled away from my microbiology. That's the reason why we are trying to help producers understand these Haney soils tests. Because if, and we're gonna talk about this in a minute here, if I get scrolled down to it, because if I have plant available nitrogen that's in an organic form and my test, let me see if I get to it here, I'm gonna go jump to this test, this portion right now. If my Haney soils test is telling me I've got 45 pounds of plant available nitrogen within my soil, why wouldn't you want to test that on your farming operation? Why wouldn't you say, you know what, maybe I don't all believe all this, but maybe I'll take one field. I will do my normal nutrient application, but I'm gonna take a portion of that field, maybe 20 acres, 40 acres. And I always love Gabe's analogy. Do what you can sleep with yourself at night. You know, if, if, you, if you can't sleep at night, if you did 200 acres, then don't do 200 acres, but do at least do 20. And compare, compare by the reduction of what the Haney soils test is telling you versus what your typical nutrient program is. And then look at the production, but more than look at the production, look at the net dollars per acre. You know, I forget the research and I don't want to miss quota, but I think it's almost between 30 to 70% of all those nutrients you put into your, your soils, your fields, you know, gets utilized it either, you know, tied up in the microbiology or oxidizes or we, we lose it because we don't have carbon. So why do you want to keep throwing money away, you know, when you've, you get the nutrient cycling from the microbiology. So these are just some things we want to think about. You know, we don't want the synthetics. We're not telling you not to utilize the synthetics, but why do I want to overapply a salt? Why do I want to waste dollars when I've got nutrients available that are plant available? So we've got to test and we've got to start building confidence, you know, what's going on. Let me go back here. I kind of jumped one to get to that that portion. But you know, what I really want to talk about is <clears throat> this is what gets confusing for guys. And a lot of times you'll hear us talk, you know, we don't want to get too many legumes in our systems and, you know, we'll collapse our aggregate structure. We'll get very platy soils. And that's absolutely right. But, you know, when we look at these Haney soils tests, you know, when I look at the CO2 respiration 
of a 46. That tells me I don't have a lot of microbiology living in my house. And it's probably a good thing I don't have a very big house. But how am I going to propagate, build the microbiology? Why well, I gotta give the microbiology what it needs in order to propagate. So I've got to pump some nitrogen in there because as I showed earlier, you know, the carbon to nitrogen ratio of a bacteria is a five to one. So it needs quite a bit of nitrogen. So I've got to provide the nitrogen so I can start building more soil microbiology. But this is the reason why we want to do these tests on an annual basis at the same time of year. You know, so we can start looking at how, okay, we come in here with a cover crop of 50% legumes. And now these are seeds per acre. This is not pounds, 50% pounds of a legume and 50% pounds of a grass. This is 50% of the seed count being legumes and 50% of it being grass. But I've got to give the biology what it needs in order to get what I want. I need more microbiology. So I've got to put a, a high legume component in there in order to feed the microbiology to kind of jumpstart them, get them producing. But also, you know, I've still got a huge grass component, all those hair roots pumping carbon in there, you know, helping feed that microbiology. But just because I do this one year doesn't mean I'm gonna do it every year. That's right, I wanna really look at my soils test the same time of year, what's my CO2 respiration. If my CO2 respiration jumps up, let's say to, you know, 130 in 12 months, <clears throat> you know, I'm gonna back this legume component off because I don't wanna get too big a party going. And I'm probably gonna back this off. And that's probably what the, the Haney soils test is gonna tell you also. So we gotta be very cautious but we got to understand why we're doing some of this because we want to build the microbiology because the bacteria build the microaggregate, but then we got to start coming in with a higher grass component to help still start feeding fungi and a more lignified material to help start building the macroaggregate. So I know that's a lot being said in a very short time and I don't know if it made any sense, but, um, just think of it, you know, we've got to have what the microbiology needs. So think of it that way at the present moment. And if there's any questions, Rihanna, let's answer some of them here right now. No, uh, Mr. Zenoff is just asking Gabe, uh, he's saying that we should open the sieves. Um, so you're saying we should not spray Roundup late in the fall. And Again, that goes back to context. Okay, first you need to ask yourself, why do I have weeds growing in the fall? Well, nature's trying to put a living root in the soil. So there's either, either uh, there's bare soil that um, it, nature's trying to cover with, with those weeds being there, or it's trying to cycle certain nutrients or it's trying to alleviate an issue such as compaction, etc. And so you have to take it in context. I am in no way saying do not address a weed issue if you have it. Now, also though, do realize that glyphosate is a biocide and it's extremely detrimental to soil biology. And so you need to be aware of that also. What I would rather do in that case, if I had a field with uh, high weed pressure, I would rather uh, get out there and seed something such as cereal rye in the fall that will inhibit that weed growth the following spring, something like that. But you have to take it into context without knowing the specific weed species, the density of them, the history, it, it's tough to say. You know, let me, if I may, add just a little bit more to that. So, <clears throat> you know, I always go back and I question, why do I have those particular plants growing out there? So let's say we have a lot of what we call early successional plants growing. What we refer to usually as early successional plants are our forbs or weeds. Well, when we go out and consult, you know, when we see things like that, you know, the first thing that kind of goes through our mind is, is this soil is probably highly bacterial. Um, and what's telling us that is we can go out and do the shovel test. We're probably going to see a 
you know, possibly a collapsed soil structure, very platy. But what's telling me that a lot of this is that, you know, one thing is <clears throat> the only form of nitrogen early successional plants can utilize or optimally utilize is nitrate. You know, as I start transforming my soils from a highly bacterial to a more fungal to bacterial, I start transitioning the form of nitrogen that's being cycled within that soil. So I go from nitrate to ammonium. So now most of our early successional plants, which we refer to as forbs or weeds, cannot utilize ammonium as a nitrogen source. And if you don't believe that, go walk into a woodland structure where it's fungally dominated in the soil and you don't see a lot of early successional plants. Now, this is the reason why the principles are so, so important. You know, I call, I like to have a double, triple whammy. You know, first thing is when I get cover on that soil surface, you gotta remember early successional plants, weed seeds, don't have a whole lot of energy. So when they germinate, they've got to capture photosynthesis pretty rapidly. But if I have cover on top of my soil, that's suppressing solar energy from reaching that, that germinating weed seed, it's probably gonna die. Now, the second thing is, as I start building cover on my soils, I also start building a beautiful habitat for insects, predators. Now, research by Dr. Jonathan Lundgren is shows that insects eat a tremendous amount of our weed seed bank. So now there's two modes of controlling those plants. Now we're not done. You know, when we start changing this microbiology in the soil from highly bacterial, and that's what these little dots are, those are bacteria, to more fungal, and that's what this little strand is here, if you can see my cursor, to more fungal dominated, we change the form of nitrogen. So now I threw just three things at inhibiting a plant that I don't want that's gonna make it more and more difficult to establish. So, you know, it kind of goes back to why these principles are so critical and keeping, keeping things in place and being intentional about doing them. Mr. Shane, I just wanna ask, um, later in the presentation, will you be talking about how to increase the MAC percentage? The what percentage? The MAC. The MAC, percent MAC? Yeah. <clears throat> well, we, okay. My presentation is pretty close to being done, but you know, this illustration, if I can find it, I got to go back to it. It's as simple as, I think it's the next slide, this slide right here. I got to produce, I need diversity of plants doing this, sending out different sugars, feeding different microbiology. The plants are what's producing a lot of the food that's utilized by the microbiology. <clears throat> so if I wanna see my percent MAC, because remember the percent MAC is telling us how well they're eating the food in the refrigerator. So let's, let's, let's think about this. So let's say we've been growing monoculture after monoculture after monoculture of let's just say alfalfa. So the only form exudates is the biology that's gonna work in my environment is gonna be biology that likes to eat the sugars that alfalfa produces. So, but if I start growing a lot more diversity of plant species, now all those different plant roots are producing all different types of sugars, carbohydrates, feeding all a diversity array of microbiology. So that's what I was trying to illustrate when I was talking, you know, when we have, and pardon my, you know, when I have, you know, more and more diversity and within my system, I'm going to feed a lot more population. You know, if, if all I have alfalfa, I've only got, you know, this, this is a pretty simple deal, but this little cartoon illustration, I just got a few people that like what alfalfa produce and root exudates. But if I've got a, you know, an eight, 10 way species mix out there, you know, I got a whole diverse group of people that like, like everything that's in there, the whole buffet. So we got to keep things pretty simple and think about it and, and put it in simple terms. I hope that answers a question. 
Mr. Zenev asks uh, how to get plants to grow in saline swells and how to build the organic matter in those areas. What is the salinity in the soils? There's saline. A above a point eight. Saline, saline areas. What is it? Salt. So salt. Salt. But I'm saying, is it point eight or above point eight, or what's our? Or does he say it doesn't make a difference? I mean, it goes back to is we've got to build cover. We've got to build cover on top of our soils. And Gabe, you may be able to answer this or Michael or Blaine, you know, what works better in those higher salinity soils. The first thing we have to do is address those areas up the watershed. So we have to hold water out of those low line areas, you know, and then you're exactly right. We got to get armor, we got to add carbon. And you do that in a variety of ways. Obviously, there's some salt tolerant crops, barley, uh, sunflowers to some extent. What we have had good luck with, and, and I've worked with a number of producers doing this in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, is planting perennials higher up above those low line areas. And then what they'll find is at, that will hold the water further up the watershed, so to speak. And then they're able to get things growing. And at times, you know, I worked with one producer. Well, what grew best in those low line areas was Russian thistle and kochia. Well, you just let them grow because at least it's a growing plant. And that, that may seem foolish, but you have to get something growing to cycle those, that cycle that saline and to uh, put a living root in there and increase carbon. Bale grazing in those areas works extremely well if that is an option to you, but you've got to grow biomass and get that soil covered because it's a biological problem and it's a problem with, with too wet of, of soils. And that's a great point. If you don't have the aggregation above you <clears throat> infiltrating that water, you're going to have that ponding. And I see what you're coming from. Thank you, Gabe. Hey, Shane, Mike here. Uh, yeah, Mike. I just reviewed the uh, Zenis soil test, and one of the locations that we tested on his project field was uh, 1.19. That was uh, fairly close to a uh, wetland. So, yeah, I mean, and like Gabe said, I mean, probably focus on helping to increase our infiltration above those areas, regions. That is a fairly high salt component. You know, you're going to have difficulty, you know, getting vegetation to grow. <clears throat> you know, and, I, and I'll, I'm, I'm pretty blunt and brutally honest. I mean, and part of my question would be, why are we trying to grow crops in that high of a salinity? I mean, is it historically... That high is it, I mean, this goes back to context. So has it always been historically that high in salt? Is it due to the fact that, you know, we're not infiltrating water above stream? Are we ponding a lot of water in those areas? You know, we're concentrating a lot of salts, you know, from synthetic nutrients. So it kind of, there's a lot of questions to be asked, but you know, of why that problems arise, but, or why it's there. Mm -hmm. So what we discussed with, uh, you know, Blaine and, and, and myself and Ray is uh, putting, putting those areas down to perennial. So that's what he's done this, this past year was get some of that low area back into perennial. No, it's good. Yeah. Are there any other questions, Ryan? Um, so is towel draining a sewer worth? Is oh, from Mr. Zainab. Can you repeat that again, please? Basically, is, is towel draining very bad? <laughs> is it bad? <laughs> yeah. Gabe, I you guess it depends on the situation, right? I mean, uh, how 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 bad is the situation? Yes. How badly do you need to seed that down to something? If it's if it's patches, do you really need to? go through um, 
that cost of, of uh, draining that area or would you rather just put it into a perennial for a few years and then try and seed it again? Um, how big is the area that you need to do that in? I don't know. I haven't been there, Michael, Blaine. You would know better than I do. Right, Michael? yeah, this is Mike. Um, yeah, I guess if, if we want to talk about the, the tile draining as a potential solution, it, it really doesn't address the root, the root cause of the problem, right? So um, if we're, we're thinking, sorry, my dog is uh, distracting me. So if we're looking at tile drainage as a solution to, to water, um, what, what are some real solutions to, to dealing with with water would be to you know increase aggregation so that we can move water down through that soil profile um, and also to store water increase the soil carbon sponge i've heard stories in the u.s where um, land has been tile drained say you know 30 40 years ago and the tile drainage quits working they come back and they figure well the the old tile is probably plugged up or collapsed, so let's put in new tile. They get in there and realize that um, there's nothing wrong with the tile. They've put in new tile, but what's happened is um, the soil is so compacted, so you know, hard pan, all the rest, that water isn't infiltrating to get to the tile. Um, so it makes you realize that the the real problem is to be addressed is uh, to rebuild the the uh, soil structure, the aggregation. And of course you do that by increase, because you know, aggregation is a biological process. How do, you, how do you get the biology back to work? You grow a green plant. So you realize that it's all interconnected. And, uh, and so our comment would be that, you know, understanding ag would be that you're not addressing the root cause by, uh, by simply tile, uh, installing tile. Well, technically, with uh, the year we've had, we could have used that water for our crops instead of having it run off. Um, it's, uh, there's a reason why there's water in the first place. I would rather use the water that is available to feed something that I can combine or can feed to animals than to have it run off into a drain somewhere um, where it's not useful to me anymore. No, no, it's a great point you brought up both Michael and Rihanna's. I mean, <clears throat> let's address the core issue. And that's a major core issue. Uh, and, you know, throughout North America, you know, is we don't infiltrate the water anywhere that the system once did. And I mean, it causes huge, huge problems. I mean, flooding, you know, nutrient runoff, <clears throat> you know, so that's one thing we need to understand. And you know, that's the reason why I went through the principles to begin with this evening is to understand what we've got to get right is we've got to get our soils covered. We've got to help let that microbiology, we allow that microbiology work as long as possible, you know, through decomposition, you know, helping build soil aggregation. <clears throat> you know, we got to create more of a effective rainfall event infiltrating more of that water we're blessed with instead of allowing it to run off and not only run off with moisture we need, but we run off a lot of times with the nutrients that we need. So is there any other questions, Rihanna? Not at this moment. You know, I've pretty much covered most of my presentation. <clears throat> you know, I wasn't real sure, you know, we can get into a lot more you know, I guess talking about some stuff here on the Haney, you know, one thing I want to acknowledge, you know, there's a standard soils test, but it's an H3 extract on all your Haney soils information. You know, some other things I look at, you know, when I'm evaluating the Haney soils test, you know, I look at my calcium to magnesium ratios, you know, kind of a three to one is where we want to be with some of those. But I was talking to Dr. Rick Haney you know, because a lot of times guys say, well, I think we're going to put lime on or, you know, I'm being told I need to put lime down. You know, Rick told me, you know, kind of look at your iron component, how much iron's in your soil. He said, you know, add up your iron and, 
your, um, my screen's kind of hidden here from me. But add up your iron and aluminum and, and see if that number's higher or lower than your calcium number. <clears throat> and he said, that'll give you some good information whether you need to look at liming or not. If those numbers, your iron and your aluminum are higher than your calcium, then you're probably adding lime is probably gonna be a beneficial thing to do. But if it's, if your calcium number is much higher than your iron and, and your aluminum number added together, then you probably really don't need to do it. You know, the other thing the Haney soils test gives us, you know, it tells us what we have for, you know, I'm trying to find it here on this particular test of available phosphorus in our soils also here. You know, we got, tells me how many pounds of phosphorus I have, you know, plant available phosphorus. So it's just not only telling us about our nitrogen needs, but it's also talking to us about what our phosphorus measurements are. You know, do we need to add these additional synthetic nutrients to our systems? And that's the question you really need to start asking yourself, you know, but you got to build confidence in these tests. I know that a lot of you have never, you've seen a Haney soils test before. You've never been around anybody that's utilized them. So I, I really encourage people to, you know, go out here and do your own testing, your own field testing and start building some confidence what these numbers are telling you and how you can use them to your benefit. If there isn't any questions, if there are, I'd like to get them or if anyone has some questions they'd like to bring in, but I really don't have a whole lot more on my presentation or if there's any more you'd like me to explain about the Haney Solis test or go back over, I'd be more than glad to. Um, Mr. Doug uh, mentioned that it would be helpful to have a referral sheet to know what the desirable ranges would be to aim for um, in the different categories that uh, the taste shows. Okay. Well, it goes back to context. I mean, I, I hate to keep using that analogy, but it's simple as that. I mean, <clears throat> your respiration, just think of it this way. We want to see respiration go up. That's telling us how many people live in our house. We want to see these numbers start building upward. There's not really a magic number you want to start hitting. You know, I want to see this organic matter start getting up around three, three and a half percent. You know, it seems like kind of some magic starts happening in those ballparks in my part of the world, but that may not be the case in your, your part of the world. You know, it seemed like once I got my CO2 respirations above, you know, 220, you know, things started occurring. You know, when I started seeing my, my organic carbon, water extracted organic carbon, you know, once we started seeing that jump up around three, 400, I mean, there was a lot of food and my percent Mac was up around 150. I mean, that was, that was, my soils were starting to really start functioning. So I can, I can share that I would like to have Michael and Blaine and yours, Rihanna's input of what you guys are seeing on some of operations have been doing this for a while of what your ranges are, but you know, we really don't know. And I mean, I'll just be pretty blunt. I mean, the regenerative ag, we don't know how far we can push some of this. I mean, the reason why the Slavita test isn't used anymore is because there's people that are exceeding the, the measurable amounts in the CO2 using the Slavita. You know, we've had to go to different tests because guys are breaking some of these numbers and measurements. So, I mean, the sky is kind of the limit. That's the way I look at it. But we just want to see these numbers start increasing. As you start implementing good practices, regenerative practices, you should start watching your numbers start increasing upward. Any other questions? Shane, we can pass on to Michael Blaine and Rihanna the uh, the uh, points that we put together as to what to look yes. for. And so we'll pass that on and have them disseminate that. I'll give it another minute here or so if someone has a question they'd like to ask. I know I appreciate everyone being on this evening. I hope it made sense. 
Blaine, Michael, Rihanna, any any points that questions you run across from the producers that you'd like Shane to address? Um, I can't think of um, specific questions right now. I just wanted to mention on that saline areas um, where I think it was Mr. Zenith that asked what to seed in those areas. Um, what we found in our cover crops that grew in those areas specifically for our region was chicory, which has a very nice root to grow in those areas. So maybe looking at some different forbs, something that you see growing in the field in those areas and then try and see if you can seed something like that. Question from David Etiquette, it was a low pH 5.1. So I guess he's referring to pH, um, the testing of the pH and then if that is low or what you would recommend in regards to pH. Well, <laughs> building back our microbiology, um, I'd kind of like to know what the crop rotation was. <clears throat> oh, okay, he says, he, he mentioned another part, he says, the reason I'm asking is all of my test results are above the ranges that we talked about except the MAC percentage, but I know my soils are not anywhere near their potential. I think we all think that. Uh, yeah, I mean. Shane, would you talk a little bit about the ability of the rhizosphere to change pH, though? Yeah, I mean, I was trying to think of a good way. Thank you, Gabe. Um, along a plant's rhizosphere, the roots itself, every millimeter, it's a different pH. And, and there's been a lot of questioning of soil pH and, you know, how, how it's measured and how it's interpreted. So just remember along that root itself at every millimeter, it's a different pH. The, the plant's sending out the chemical signals attracting the microbiology. So maybe, maybe the plant needs some iron. Well, the only way the microbiology is gonna be able to access iron is at about a pH of 5.5. You know, the pH has changed, you know, so for optimal nitrogen use, now this is synthetic nitrogen, you know, a pH of about a 6.5 to what a 7.2. So we've got to be, we've kind of got to understand how things, how nature interprets things versus man interprets things. So if my pH is low and it's, it is telling me that, you know, I probably want to look at some diversity of plant species. <clears throat> you know, so I'm putting a lot of different architecture of roots in the soil. You know, sending out a lot of different chemical signals, waking up a lot of different microbiology and building a lot of cover on my soil. So that's how I would look to try to address it. Mm -hmm. And what we're, what we're finding with those who have been on the regenerative path for a while, a pH of, of you know, five and above, um, it will over time you'll be able to, to raise that number considerably if you have the diversity in the biological activity. Often when we work with producers, one of the first things we look at is that soil respiration, that CO2 burst test. We'd really like to see those numbers well in excess of 200 and, and, and higher. That just means the soil is, is alive. Now, again, you gotta put that in context time of year and remember that even though you take these tests approximately the same time every year, they're gonna differ some because it's a biological test and your biology is gonna change according to uh, moisture conditions, temperature, etc. cetera. So, so don't be alarmed by that, just look for the trend. But it all starts with living plants and diversity. It starts there. and. In our cropping systems, let's be honest, um, diversity is lacking in the majority of crop rotations. Now, I know there are some people on this call tonight who have very diverse crop rotations, and that's great. I commend you for that. But by and large, uh, the diversity in crop rotations is very poor. And that, of course, is 
often driven by by price, et cetera. So we need to look for ways to diversify that. A great point. You might also, with that pH, just look at your aluminum and your iron numbers and <clears throat> see where they add up compared to your calcium. If they exceed. Mike here, I would, I would yep. just add that, you know, this is an interesting, you know, sold pH in Manitoba and Saskatchewan is an interesting question because it appears that our uh, pHs have uh, slowly crept upwards. We have, we have a lot of soils over eight now. And I, I don't think that they were at eight 100 years ago. I don't have any evidence to support that. And it's been difficult to try to find um, some evidence. And most soil scientists don't seem to want to say much about it. But I think what's happening, part of it is, you know, we now have highly bacterial dominated soils and bacteria secrete alkaline products, uh, fungi excrete, you know, organic acids. So if you have a highly bacterial dominated soil and very little fungi, you'd expect that that's, you know, that's out of balance. So slowly the, that soil is going to creep up in pH. So if you're trying to raise or lower soil pH, uh, it appears probably one of the best methods is, is to biologically change that soil. It may even be the only way to do it. Like really, if we're honest about it, how much success have guys had using lime or whatever to, to actually change soil pH uh, for, it, for any length of time. So I think biology is probably our best way to, and for most soils, like David has a slightly different situation. He probably has one of the only acidic soils that I've seen in Manitoba, but for the most part, our soils are, are well above seven and that we need to uh, probably look at uh, increase in the fungal component to try to bring those soils back down closer to seven. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Michael Blaine, but I've read that the plants can also control the pH um, around its roots. Well, it, it controls the pH in its immediate environment and controls it in some way in order to be able to function properly. Um, I can't remember where I read the research about this, but pH is just one small component of all of the different things affecting your crop and um, it will change based on how your organic matter increases or um, what, how the year is going and uh, one foot of soil can be different from another. So to focus on just one thing like pH um, would definitely not be something that I would do. Um, I would try and look at the overall picture and what I see the crops are telling me. Because soil tests, they don't give you, they don't give you a, 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 an accurate answer for everything. And depending on when you took it, there, there are so many um, variations that you can get in the results. So to consistently do soil testing gives you a better idea, but you also need to be in the field itself and look at the plants and maybe do some sap analysis to really kind of figure out what's what's going on and maybe how you can improve the situation. It's Blaine here, just one, one more comment. When we did the soil tests and, and we, we gathered all the samples in late May and June, we were in an exceptionally dry spring and we were also in a very cold spring. So Right. I'm sometimes wondering if some of our numbers aren't skewed just a little bit because of those two environmental factors. That's that's very, very true. And that's what Gabe said a little bit ago. I mean, <clears throat> I look at the Haney soils test as like a, and I love Ray Archuleta's analogy, is it's like a blood test for the soil. You know, so it's going to be completely different. You know, your blood test is going to be completely different your blood sugars prior to, you know, eating versus post eating. And it's the same with the soil. Environment's going to play a huge component because, I mean, we work with an ecology and this microbiology. So, you know, if you got into a very dry, cold, you know, environment, you know, it, it changes a little bit. Yeah, the microbiology is going to completely function totally different. So that's a great, great point, Blaine. Another point um, Paul Overview made is uh, the Haney test is being able to take them in the early spring or late fall. 
um, May or early June when the soil warms seems to be preferred, but it's uh, more difficult with the growing season that we have. Most of the time that's when um, the crops are ready seeded or, or something like that, which delays it a bit. Yep. <clears throat> you know, uh, we've got producers down here, you know, they're, they're antsy to plant corn and beans in the cold soils, which I still haven't figured out. And um, with the length of our growing seasons. And, you know, I, I encourage them, you know, we still pull the Haney soils test, but, you know, look at trying to do a reduction or a post application while the crop's growing in the field. And uh, we've had really good success doing it that way. Yeah, we, we should not be loading our fertility when that plant is so small anyway. It, there's just no way to, to, uh, for that plant to utilize it. We're going to lose too much of that fertility, fertility being applied as inorganic. And so uh, with our clients, we're strongly recommended recommending to minimize uh, fertilizer application at the time of planting and then to uh, pull the test later. And what we're finding is a, a significant dollar savings in, in the amount and cost the fertilizer being applied. We're just able to minimize that fertility rate according to the actual conditions that year. Great points, Gabe. And I agree with Mr. Gabe in the sense of um, if you compare it to a person, a plant to a person, and you give it, you give the person a, a big buffet and you say, eat all you can, all you want, but then you have to survive for the next three months without food. Um, that person is not going to look in the best condition after three months. So, um, as soon as you can spread it out a bit, you have a lot more options and so on. So it's definitely something to look at and to try and do in, in operations as it helps you to spread your risk a bit and also have an, a more accurate um, plan at the end of the day. Darren Mattis asks, can we run through a fertility recommendation for a soil test? For example, use the test in the pre presentation to plan for 50 bushels an acre of wheat, something like that. Okay, I'm not sure what your guys' <clears throat> normal nutrient requirements are for 50 bushel wheat in your locality. So, <clears throat> you know, so how many units of nitrogen microblain is normally used for 50 bushel wheat? Of well, synthetic? you know, I think if we were just look talking about like what would typical fertility rates be for, for say Manitoba. Um, I would think we're most guys now are in that hundred pounds of actual N per acre, probably, you know, that, that'd be basically two, two pounds of N per bushel. Okay. <clears throat> so, and so phosphorus what? maybe, Go you ahead. know, sorry, um, phosphorus in that, 30 to 50 pounds per acre, actual. Okay. Is most of that fall applied? Do you, how much is fall applied versus spring applied? Or no, okay, get, we're talking spring wheat here, spring so that wheat. would all be spring okay. applied. Yep. Okay. So when I look at, you know, let's just use a soil test here. And if you can see my cursor. So it's telling me I've approximately got about 45 pounds of plant available nitrogen <clears throat> in my soil. So what we're visiting with guys about and encouraging guys to do is if this 100 pounds the acre is your typical nutrient application, all we're saying is let's back that off and let's do an area where we're only running about 55 units of nitrogen and do that size, I would, I would do a, a, a test area, but need to make it significant enough that when we harvest it, we know, compare it, you know, side by side to where you did your normal nutrient applications. 
But what we also like to see you do is do a very small zero check strip, no fertility, then compare all three. And, you know, don't get tied up so much about the production. And, and honestly, we don't see a whole lot of variance in production, but pay attention to what, how much you netted in dollars. Then by reducing, you know, 45 units of synthetic nutrients, did you net the same, if not more, than where you applied the 100? So we want to start changing the way we see things and interpret things. Because like we said, Gabe said, you know, a lot of that microbiology will utilize a lot of that nitrogen you're putting out there. And if we limit some of that salt we're putting out there, we're keeping more moisture in our soil for the microbiology. So that's how I would interpret it. And that's what I would encourage producers to do. And that's what we do do. And that's exactly right, Shane. And it's extremely important to remember the only way to build biology is extremely lazy. And the only way to build, for example, a zootobacter, which are, are bacteria that have the ability to take atmospheric nitrogen and utilize it, thus making it available for plants, the only way you're going to increase the numbers of those in your soil is by starting to back off on the, the amount of nutrients you apply. And so what we find, it's kind of a compounding effect. As you back off over time, your soil will become much healthier and will be able to cycle more in on its own. Great points, Gabe. And, you know, and also, and Gabe, Gabe nailed it on the head there. The microbiology is pretty lazy and so are the plants. If the plants don't have to put out, if we've got plenty of nitrogen along that rhizosphere, and that plant doesn't have to put out a chemical signal to have an association with let's, lay, let's talk about mycorrhizal, it's not going to do it. The problem with it is, is when that nitrogen doesn't be held in place or we lose it, and that plant doesn't have that association with mycorrhizal, helping feeding it not only nutrients but water, you know, that, that stresses our plants. You know, so we got to start thinking about that. That's the reason, I mean, <clears throat> we're, we at no point in time will tell someone to walk away from a nutrient program. What we encourage people to do is go out here and test, build confidence and building resiliencies back in your soils. Are there any further questions, Rihanna or Michael or Blaine, would you like to add anything to this? I would just add, you know, thinking about nitrogen um, specifically, we don't have a shortage of nitrogen in our soils. Uh, the total nutrient testing that we did, and we haven't really talked about that tonight, that's maybe another discussion, but I think on average over the, the farms in this project, the 45 farms, uh, it was something like 7,000 plus pounds of nitrogen uh, just in the top foot of soil per acre. It was 9,000. Like yeah, I think, yeah, it was something like, so it, was a, it was a big number. Um, and that's because, you know, a lot of it's locked up in organic matter and we still have, you know, for, for every percent of organic matter, there's a thousand pounds of N locked up with the, but all we need to do is make a little bit of that available if we have, you know, active biology and nutrient cycling happening. Uh, so there, there's lots of opportunity to, um, to start to get the biology to function and, and then start backing off on, on nitrogen. That seems to be, you know, where we can start. That's like the low hanging fruit. And like Gabe was saying, there's in, in a healthy system, like if you think about what, what, what the prairie was before we came here and started farming it, it was <laughs> roughly 75% grass, 25%, 20 or so percent forb, and only 5% legume. It was not a high legume system. So why, were, why was that prairie so productive? And the, the biomass that was created was you know, was, was big. So how did that system function? Well, a lot of that nitrogen was being made available to the plant by, um, like Gabe was saying, the, the free living nitrogen fixers that don't need to associate with a legume. But unfortunately, we don't really have that functioning anymore uh, 
for a number of reasons. One is lack of aggregation. They need it. They need the aggregate to be able to do their job within that aggregate. You have a, a lower oxygen environment where they can um, do their job. The other thing is too, if we don't have porosity for air, which is 78% nitrogen to move into that soil. And then for that atmospheric end to be converted into a plant available form of N, um, that just doesn't happen. So there's a number of things we can do to kind of drive the biology to make, yeah, there you go. Air is going to move into that soil. It has aggregates there. Um, that soil is going to be able to um, create some of its own nitrogen through uh, the free li living nitrogen fixers. Well, it's a free living, it's through decomposition. <clears throat> I mean, the amino acids, I mean, there is a smorgasbord and that's what Dr. Rick Haney's test is capturing. It's all these other components of nitrogen that a standard soils test does not gather or inform us on. That's what Dr. Rick Haney's soils test is acknowledging. All these other forms of nitrogen that we haven't even been taking credit for. And there's a significant amount and I, I like making this statement. <clears throat> It's never been a due to a lack of nitrogen, these systems. It's been a due to a lack of soil aggregation. It's the microbiology, getting that fungal component out. You're not gonna build this crumbly structure without the fungal component. There's not a piece of tool, there's not a piece of engineering that you can go write a check for to accomplish this. This is understanding how nature functions how do I mimic the processes, understand the principles, get these soils covered, build our fungal component up <clears throat> in order so, as Michael acknowledged, build water or build the aggregate in order to infiltrate more water and oxygen back in my soil. 78% of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. It's not a lack of that. It's a lack of the aggregation to help get the nitrogen molecule into our soils. In order to let the free living nitrogen fixating bacteria utilize it, break that bond. Any further questions? Any questions? Well, if there's no other questions, I really appreciate the opportunity to present and <clears throat> share maybe some information in regards to the Haney Soils Test with the producers up here in Canada. And I, I thank you, Ray, for helping uh, relay the questions to me and Michael and Blaine for helping organize. And I wanna thank our Director of Operations, Kathy Richburg, for getting everything set up so we could have this presentation tonight. So thank you again. and. Everybody have a safe in evening. And two weeks, Shane. In two yes, weeks. Two weeks. Sorry, yep, Gabe. We'll thank having you. another one. Yep. Appreciate that. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. And uh, thank you again. Thanks, Shane. Thank you, Michael.